Economics uh, Lecture 13. Today we discuss the topic of limits to credit expansion. Limits to credit expansion. First of all, let's remind what we did from last time. Last time we said that commercial banks are eager to expand credit. Credit expansion is economic, economically identical to inflation. In other words, credit expansion is by nature inflationary. It is inflation. The substance of inflation is the extraction of an inflation tax. Bankers do profit uh, by expanding credit, by extracting the inflation tax. And now we get to the question is, why don't they simply do more, a lot more credit expansion? What is preventing them from keep on expanding forever? There has to be some limit. Something's got to impose them limits. So limits to credit expansion in this particular case for today, we mean the limits imposed by the free market. If people are free, they can respond back to the banks. In other words, people are vulnerable to getting robbed by the inflation tax. So they got their weapon, weapons back. They can respond back. The first and their foremost weapon is also the simplest of them all. And it is simply do not use money. At least do not use the money that commercial banks are giving you. So, the first uh, weapon which I do like to use occasionally is I don't trust these pieces of paper which Bulgarian uh, National Bank is issuing. I simply don't have trust or confidence. So, you see how I use the words trust and confidence? So, let's use them here. Trust slash confidence in money. Well, let me put it. I do trust much more Jean-Claude Trichet and the European Central Bank than our Bulgarian politicians, which are of course much more corrupt and eager at any point in time to back out on their promises and engagement. So, one single way that I can respond is, hey, I just don't hold this, these pieces of paper. Well, you just saw me that I actually have them some, and I have some for coffee and for my lunch today, and maybe for the afternoon to fill up my beamer. Not much more than that. I don't hold very many. In other words, I hold in my wallet mostly what we call transaction money. Transaction money is just money that we keep for day-to-day -day transactions until I get my next paycheck. So, what do I do with the rest of my lever? I immediately get rid of it. I get rid of it and buy euro, buy gold, invest in oil, whatever. So, do not use money, in other words, trust and confidence in the money itself. Within part one, there is a separate uh, piece, which is trust of deposits, and when I say deposit, I mean banks or bank deposits. Personally, I don't trust Bulgarian banks either, so the simplest way to react to a credit expansion, and I certainly do react personally, is I don't keep my money in the bank because I don't feel it is safe. Also, 
I don't see or actually I see my money is losing purchasing power, so I better convert it in something harder, something of more stable value than the piece of paper with a little bit of ink on it and some national hero. So I personally don't keep much or any deposits in the banks. Now, it doesn't mean you don't have to, well, people do keep them, but in general, one of the major responses to people which limits dramatically, which limits dramatically the ability of commercial banks to expand credit is that they don't keep their money in the banks in the first place. You never put it in the bank, all right? Now, as part of it is, if you're not uh, going to play their game, is simply do not borrow from the banks. The very minute that you borrow from the bank, you are subject to their rules, you are no longer independent, your behavior is suddenly changed, and of course, banks have their ways, usually written within the contract to effectively manipulate you or your behavior. So, the very basic idea of this whole section one is phenomenally simple. Don't get yourself involved in the banking system with their deposits, their credits, or their money altogether. All right? This is as simple as that. If you don't get involved with them, they have no way to get money, to get, excuse me, reserves, to expand and everything else. You gotta understand, fractional reserve banking means that the demand deposits are more than reserves, and it necessarily means that people must have confidence in the system. So, without any confidence in the system, there is no way for the system to get going. Now, I move on to section two or part two. Well, what if people had confidence in the system? What if they got to use the paper money? What if they got to borrow and also deposit their money? And suddenly they get to lose confidence. So the second part is called loss of confidence. Now it is important to understand at least people in general, the masses, aren't stupid so that they lose confidence in the banks for no reason. Usually people lose confidence in the banks because they feel they sense or they actually observe that banks are not simply using their money, which is okay, but banks are abusing their money and are abusing their trust. Well, how do banks abuse the trust? Well, they give a lot more loans. They provide a lot of reckless credits, as we've seen from 2002 all the way to 2006. All U.S. banks were giving all sorts of crazy loans that no common sense person would usually think even for a moment that it's okay, but banks have been abusing it. Now in the United States it goes a lot worse, uh, not as bad in Bulgaria. You have a lot of deceased people, meaning people that were dead for many years. They get their social security, their credit and everything else, and you can get a credit on, on you know, uh, payable by a dead person. Uh, even worse. Uh, again, you gotta understand, it's the, all it takes uh, for in the US, well, at least during the boom years, during the crazy years, is to have a social security. Well, a lot of children which they get born two months later might actually get a social security. Again, not always. So, you can get a one-year-old child, of course, it's still a suckling, and 
they, the parents get a credit card on the child, so the parents charge their credit card, and then they buy cars on you know their children, meaning one or two year old child. I mean, child can't even walk, okay, can't even talk. So that's the kind of stuff that when people get to see that these are the crazy things that banks get to abuse the trust that people have in the banks. And when they see that, they get to lose confidence. An example where everybody in my little hometown, that's called Lovich, uh, sees it, like 25,000 people. And now people, it's everywhere in town. 25th branch of a bank is opening in town. You have 25 branches in a little town of 25,000 people with no industry, no production, no prosperity, and the whole town is living on credit? People understand now and everyone's asking me, this is crazy or what? How are these banks even supporting the heating and the super expensive rents on these offices? let alone actually make a lot of money and profit. People understand, in this little, little town there aren't jobs. People are extremely poor. Who are they giving credit to? How do they get the money back? People get to think even that banks are engaging in money laundering, which might actually be true, I don't know. But what I do know is that this little town has barely, uh, uh, let's say, customership for three, four banks, or three, four branches. And 25 of them means that, hey, something is fundamentally wrong with system with the system and people feel it. So, what is the reaction that you see banks abusing your confidence? Well, you lose confidence. When you lose confidence, what's the step to do? People withdraw money. Yes, people withdraw their money. So, loss of confidence usually results in a fairly sudden withdrawal, massive, that's the key word, is massive, withdrawal of money. Massive means that you have a big percentage, maybe 30%, maybe 50%, as in the case of Northern Rock. 90% of people line up in front of the bank eager to get their money back. Of course, as is always the case, you heard all of these uh, politicians, I'm talking roughly what, three months, was it three, four months ago, uh, during the Northern Rock bank crisis, your money is safe, there is no problem in all of this stuff. Well, if the money is safe and there is no problem, why even worry about it? Why even pay attention to it? Just give them the money and be done with it. The point is that the money is not safe. Well, the money is not there at all. In a fractional reserve banking system, when the reserve ratio is 10%, you got 10 times more demand deposits than actual money. So, for every 10 customers, one customer's money is in there, for the other nine, the money is not there, all right? So, they're trying to rebuild confidence. Of course, the cheapest and the best way to do is propaganda, but once people have lost their confidence and see these lines in front of the bank, they say, the hell with confidence in God and politicians. Let me just get my money back and have it in my wallet or put it in a safer bank and the hell with them, all right? So, this thing where people suddenly lose confidence and as a result of the loss of confidence, all rush in a massive withdrawal of money and deposits has a name and it's called a bank run. Shown in many old movies, especially depicting the Great Depression, I don't want to get into that today. So, the most powerful weapon of all that people have in order to stop the banking system from extracting that inflation tax, which is based on abuse of trust and confidence, is actually a run on the bank. A bank run is called Chasen's 
bankers. Meaning it brings their uh, common sense back and it realizes or forces them to realize that their banks are not invincible but subject to the whim of the public. What is characteristic of a bank run is that it works like an avalanche. You know what's an avalanche, guys? Yeah. Well, it's kind of like in the mountain, you got a snow, a little bit of snow starts falling, and then it drags more snow down, and uh, at the very end, it sw sweeps everything on its way. People, houses, anything. So, it has uh, an effect where once it's getting started, it's feeding on itself and it's getting it's spreading around. So a bank run usually means that all you need is 100 to 200 people just lining up in front of the bank. People seeing that, oh, some other people are with, you know, waiting to get their money. Say, well, just in case, let me go and get my money to be on the safe side. And before you know, in a couple of hours, you already had from 200 people, 1,000 people. And before you know it, uh, especially in modern days, but also back in the old days, you already have a reporter who's already shooting pictures, and you already have somebody who's showing it on a TV that uh, apparently people are worried about their deposits in this bank, and before you know it, everyone, you know, the rush is on. How long is a bank broke when there is an actual bank run? Usually a couple of hours. Rarely can a bank survive one day. One day is impossible. That's rare in history to see that you got a bank run, the bank is giving the money back, and it's got enough money for a full day. That's impossible. So what the banks would usually do in a bank run, they say, okay, everybody's gonna get your money, and they give the money slowly. 20 minutes one person, 20 minutes next person, etc. So by the end of the day, they barely serve 10% of the people and say, see, everybody, we gave everybody's money. Well, everybody's not getting their money because out of 2,000 people in the waiting line, 200 got it. And they're almost running out, so they're waiting on the trucks uh, from the central bank to print some more and load it up. So, questions? Yes, because the, in a fractional reserve system, they got available less than what people have deposited. So, with a, let's say, 10% fractional reserve, as is, has been common throughout history, at least, uh, let's call it modern history, all it takes is 15-20% of depositors to walk in, get their money, and the money is, is and the bank is broke. Alright? So, that's the most powerful weapon, and this is the dread, the fear of every banker. Even worse, bank run once it has started, and of course, a bank run, this is an economic necessity. In a fractional reserve bank, uh, banking system, a bank run is guaranteed to end up in bankruptcy. So, whenever there is a bank run, people see the bank bankrupt, usually by the end of the day. They realize, of course, that it is bankrupt. So, what's the logical conclusion people get to think? Wow, this bank got bankrupt at 4 o'clock, it didn't have the money. I better walk to my bank and just in case get it out. Once the whole thing is over, I'm going to put it back in. So the problem with bank runs is once there is a run, the bank is bankrupt, people see and they madly rush and make a run on all the other banks. And before you know it, one bank run leads to a run on the banking system as a whole. And of course, the banking system is inherently bankrupt, and the result is a wild crisis. Very common back in history. For example, right now, isn't it like right now in the like, in US? Okay. Well, essentially... But the result is in Russia, like, a, like read today. Mm -hmm. In Russia, lots of banks are closed now. They start to close, but so it's all over the world? Yeah, well, well, okay, so, well, now, uh, all right, so first of all, the credit 
crisis which you have in the United States is a crisis of a loss of confidence. A big chunk of that was the US banking system, commercial banking system, but another just as big part was uh, investment banks. And then you also have all of these institutions. So the answer is essentially the substance is the, the same. Uh, I talked with you guys about the shadow banking system last time, right? So this is the same thing. People suddenly lose confidence. These people again in the shadow banking system, they're not common people who just deposit their money in the bank. But they're ordinary investors who put in that SIV their money hoping to get rather than the 3% safe return on a US government bond to get a 5 or 6% on a presumably just as safe subprime mortgage okay or subprime security right so again it is the same thing once the system builds and expands and expands once you get a loss of confidence you have a bank run now let me try to clarify for you that's not part of the chapter or the course it is known or called in english a run on the bank a run on the bank is the same thing as a bank run, but you may have a run on the currency. So you get a run on the currency. A run on the currency is similar. I mean, I teach this stuff in international finance. This is where people lose confidence in their own national currency and they rush to swap their own national currency, maybe Russian rubles or Euro, all right? Then you get a run on the Russian ruble or Bulgarian left. Similarly, you may get now what is called a run on hedge funds. Well, this is exactly what happened in early March now of 2008. Suddenly, investors that were fairly confident in hedge funds lost their confidence, uh, like Carlyle Group, and they rush and try to get their money out. Well, what's the fund going to do? Well, it's got to sell massively their investments, mortgages and whatever else. And you get the spiral feeding on itself. People pull money, the fund's got to sell 30, 50 billion, then the fund selling 50 billion, all securities, mortgages, and everything else fall on prices. Then other fund investors say, wow, these securities collapsed and our fund has them. So they start withdrawing and you have a run on the hedge funds. All right. So you can get a run on any financial institution whose nature is that of a pyramid. Now, the pyramid in many financial institutions is simply called leveraged. In other words, they borrowed and used borrowing to invest in it. So leverage works by expanding credit during the boom, but when there is a loss of confidence in those leveraged institutions, the essence, the meaning of a leverage is identical to the meaning of fractional reserves. The idea of leverage is that you actually borrow and try to do more, meaning buy more assets, buy more mortgages, buy more of whatever with borrowed money. And that borrowed money again is based on fractional reserves. So you kind of like have a pyramid, the monetary pyramid, and then another pyramid on top of it. I really don't want to get into that. How much time we got? Like One two minute. minutes? One minute? All right, so we're done with loss of confidence. The third one is loss of reserves. Suppose one bank is perfectly prudent and another bank is eager or greedy to expand credit 
and of course by expanding credit to make more money. So you got two bands, let me try to draw the picture here. These are at the bottom reserves and you got another bank here. These are also the uh, reserves of this bank. And this bank being bank greedy, greedy bank, uh, does by expanding more credit. So they extend this credit and they do this by lowering their reserve ratio. In other words, their overall credit it increases relative to the reserves. In other words, they engage in credit expansion. Well, the guy who's borrowing or getting the credit would actually spend it, maybe buy a house. And when he buys a house, he pays, for example, with a check. Again, whether it is a bank transfer, a check, or the guy actually withdraws the money and pays in cash, as long as the seller, the one who gets the money, is a customer of a different bank, so this is bank A, and this is uh, bank uh, B, so as long as the seller is a customer of bank B, and the buyer is a customer, which the buyer is also the borrower, customer of bank A, well, it could be also an investor, doesn't matter, buying uh, something, the result is that once the seller deposits his check in B, B is going to call on A for a payment. So he bought a house for 100,000, B is saying to A, well, give us the 100,000. And the result will be that suddenly Bank A will lose these reserves and these reserves will get transferred over here to B. So, the result is that now the rapidly expanding bank will lose, let's say, for the sake of example, half of its reserves and it becomes dramatically unstable. This bank has no choice but to contract credit. So, because it is losing reserves, the loss of reserves results in limits to credit expansion. This bank cannot engage in expanding credit because it's going to lose reserves. So, as long as one bank consistently expands credit at a faster rate than the other bank, there will be some movement and loss of reserves from the rapidly growing bank, and the loss of reserves will constrain or limit or put the growth, uh, put a constraint on the growth of credit expansion. Of course, if you have 100 banks and each one is trying to expand, again, those that expand the fastest will lose reserves to those that are expanding the slowest, and the result will be that soon enough those that expand fast will have to actually contract. For this, all that is necessary is that you have a large number of banks and that these banks compete against each other. Because if this bank is expanding too rapidly, this bank has the uh, strategy of accumulate some of the claims, then it comes here, calls on the reserves, and bankrupts its competitor, all right? So the idea is that as long as you have competition, it keeps commercial banks under check. So now that we've seen what the free market, the limitations, the three limitations that the free market imposes on commercial banks, the next time we're going to look at how commercial banks actually counter the free market to negate these uh, restraints by the market. And the short and simple answer is by creating themselves a central bank. So next time we're going to talk about the central bank as a device to counter the free market and to allow commercial banks to expand more credit than they would be able to expand 
if the market was free and if there was no central bank. Is this guy clear so far? It's good enough for today? Okay.